Hello and welcome to another installment of Caesar Algebras from a Novice Perspective. Today we're going to talk about spectral theory. Now one may wonder why is it important for us to know about spectral theory? We're going to study Caesar Algebras after all. But the fact of the matter is that the theory of Caesar Algebras is very closely tied to the spectral theory. And many important results are proven using spectral, spectral theory. And in fact, some of the central concepts in C star algebra theory are stated in terms of spectrums. So we really need to know what this kind of thing is. And first off, we have the basic definitions, of course. So if we have a unital Banach algebra A, then the spectrum of an element, which we denote by the sigma symbol of A here, is equal to the set of all complex numbers lambda such that this particular element is not an invertible element in the algebra A. And as a contrast to the spectrum, we define the resolvent set of A to be the complement of its spectrum here. So the resolvent set of A in the algebra is just the complement of the spectrum. And then we have the resolvent function, which we denote by R sub A, which is equal to the inverse of lambda times the unit minus a, which we have here. And this is, of course, a well-defined expression for any lambda that is not in the, in the spectrum. That is, for any lambda in the resolvent set, we can define this resolvent function. And this is an analytic function, which is going to be important for us later on. Now, if a is a non-unital algebra, we will instead consider the, the unitization a tilde that we went over in the last lecture. So if we have a unital Banach algebra, then we don't really need to care about the unitization. But if we have a non-unital algebra, we still want to be able to talk about the spectrum of elements in this algebra. And in this case, we use the unitization of a, a to really define the spectrum of the elements in the following way. It's just completely a lot analogous with the only difference that every time we use a in the original definition we now use a tilde instead. Now some fundamental properties of the spectrum that we need to know uh, are the following. So the first important one, maybe the most important one, is that if we take any element in any Banach algebra then the spectrum of this element a is a non-empty compact set in C. And really what we have to prove now is three th things. We need to prove that this spectrum is going to be closed, bounded, and non-empty. And these are kind of easy to prove except for the non-empty part. That's actually kind of tricky. So first off, we prove that the spectrum is closed by arguing that the resolvent set is an open set. And we do this by noting that the set of invertible elements in an algebra is always going to be open. And likewise, if we want to prove that this spectrum is a bounded set, it's actually quite easy as well. So we just have to note that if we have an element A with norm less than one, then this inverse that we have exists as the following geometric series over here. So this geometric series, which I'm outlining right now, is very central to this kind of theory and it's worth actually memorizing this exact expression because it comes up all the time when you talk about spectral theory and we're actually going to see it in future lectures as well this exact expression if i don't uh, misremember things so now generally if we have a lambda which has a larger absolute value than the norm of a then this expression here, this element, which is can be factored like this. And then of course, a divided by lambda has norm less than or equal to one, which means that this expression here is an invertible element. And from this, it's pretty easy to show that the spectrum is in fact a bounded set. But now, how do you actually prove that the spectrum is always going to be a non-empty set? This is actually not at all trivial, and it's not an easy statement to prove. But you can do it by arguing in the following way, and I'm not going to go over the entire proof. It's, it's kind of complicated, but not really, 
but it is kind of long and technical, so I'm not going to go over it here. But the basic gist of it is, is the following. So we begin by arguing that the resolvent function is analytic and bounded on its domain. So if the, the domain of the resolvent function, which is this resolvent set here, if that is equal to the entire complex plane, then the resolvent function will be an entire analytic and bounded function. And therefore, you can use Liouville's theorem to argue that this function, the resultant function, has to be a constant function. But this cannot possibly be the case. And therefore, you reach a contradiction that way. But as I said, this is sort of the basic gist of the proof. The full proof, you can find it all over the place. But it's not as easy as I make it seem right here. But this last part is maybe the most important out of these properties, but all of these properties is, of course, important for us. And one other property that I think is worth mentioning about the spectrum is the following, that if we have an element A and we have P to be any non-constant polynomial over the complex numbers, then, of course, we can define P evaluated at A as an operator in or as an element in the algebra. And then the spectrum of P evaluated at, at A will be the same as P of the spectrum of A. And this is a statement that is not that difficult to prove. So this is something we see that by noting that for any complex number mu, we have some factorization of P of Z minus U mu of the following form where we have P of Z minus mu is equal to some constant lambda zero times z minus lambda 1 times z minus lambda 2 and so on up till z minus lambda n where of course by construction mu will be equal to p evaluated at lambda 1 lambda 2 up to lambda n by construction really and then of course we use this factorization which we have here to argue that p of a minus mu times the unit has to be equal to this expression here this factored expression. And this factored expression is going to be invertible if and only if every factor, which we have here, is invertible itself. And therefore, if mu is in the spectrum of P of A, which we calculate using this expression here, then there must be some lambda i in the spectrum of A, such that mu is equal to P of lambda i. Because if, say, this element is not invertible, then lambda 1 must be in the spectrum of A. But then mu is, of course, equal to P of lambda 1 by this construction we have here. So really, this is the way you prove that uh, the spectrum of P evaluated at A is going to be equal to P of the spectrum of A. Or the image of the spectrum of A under P, however you want to express it. Now, let's go over one important consequence of this basic uh, spectral theory that we have developed here so far. And this is not really that much of a complicated statement, really, but it is going to be useful for us later on. And it's the following, that if we have a simple commutative and unital Banach algebra, then this algebra A is going to be isomorphic to the set of complex numbers. And this is known as the gelfand masur theorem. And it can be stated in a few different ways, but we're going to state it like this, and we're going to use it like this later on when we're talking about the Gelfand theory for uh, general Banach star algebras. And this proof is actually not that complicated once you have this power of C star, or, or what am I saying, the power of the spectral theory. And let's go over it quickly. So we note that since A is a simple algebra, it contains no non-trivial ideals. And as a result, the zero element must be the only non-invertible element in A. Because if we have any other non-invertible element in this algebra, then the principal ideal generated by that element will be a non-trivial ideal. And therefore, A would not be simple in this case. So since A is simple, there can be only zero, which is a non-invertible element in A. And now, if we use the fact that the spectrum of any element in A is non-empty, 
This implies that for every A in the algebra, there is some complex number lambda such that A minus lambda times the unit is equal to zero. Because by definition, the spectrum contains all complex numbers lambda such that a minus lambda times 1 is non-invertible in the algebra, but 0 is the only non-invertible element in the algebra. So from this we get that a must be equal to lambda times 1 for some complex number lambda. And from this it's pretty easy to see that the statement just follows immediately. Now as a final topic for today's lecture I want to talk about the spectral radius in general. So this is going to be central for us as well and we're going to see today why that is. And the spectral radius of an element A, which we denote by this Greek letter rho, is defined by the following expression here. So it's the supremum of all the absolute values of lambda where lambda is, or the supremum of the absolute value of lambda where lambda is some element of the spectrum of A. And this spectral radius may seem like it shouldn't have much to do with the Banach structure of, an, of the algebra, but it actually does. And if we use the Laurent expression or expansion of this inverse here, which is equal to this series which we have over here on the resolvent set of A, then one can prove the following statement. So the spectral radius is actually given by the following formula. So rho of A is equal to the limit as n tends to infinity of a to the power of n and then you take the norm of that and then you take this norm to the power of 1 over n. So this formula here is actually quite amazing and it's actually a big deal as we shall see. So for instance let's see why this statement is actually kind of interesting in and of itself without even going into its consequences. So first off consider the matrix algebra which we have looked at before, with the star operator given by Hermitian conjugation. Then, for any matrix in the algebra, the spectral radius, which is just the maximum absolute value of the eigenvalues of the matrix, is going to be equal to this limit of the norm over here. And this is true for any Banach norm on this algebra which is quite amazing. It doesn't matter if you take the one norm, if you take the infinity norm, or if you take the C star norm, in fact. Any norm will do. It will always produce the spectral radius by this spectral radius formula. And more generally, this connection that we have between Banach norms and spectral theory has some important ramifications. And today, as a final sort of note, we're going to look at one of the most interesting ones from a C-star perspective, which is the following, that the C-star norm is unique in the following sense, that if we have a star algebra, then there is at most one norm that makes A into a C-star algebra. So let's look at how we actually prove this statement. First off, let's assume that we have some C-star norm on the algebra. Then, for any self-adjoint element A, we have that the following is true. So the norm of A squared here is equal to this by the C star property. But this, or excuse me, the norm of this is not equal to this by the C star property. The norm of this is just equal to this because A squared is equal to A star times A because A is self-adjoint. But this expression here is by the C star property equal to the norm of A squared. Now, this implies the following, that the spectral radius of A, the self-adjoint element, is equal to this limit over here. So, when we calculate this spectral radius using the spectral radius formula, of course we don't have to just pick n here. We can take any subsequence of natural numbers as long as this subsequence tends to infinity. And in particular, this subsequence has the following property, that a to the power of 2n which we have here, the norm of this is just equal to the norm of A to the power of 2n. But this expression here is just equal to the norm of A by definition. So all of this implies that the, the spectral radius of A is equal to the norm 
of A. So this is true for any self-adjoint element in the Caesar algebra. But as a result, this has the following implication for any random element A in the algebra, that the norm of A squared is by the C star property equal to the norm of A star times A. But A star times A is a self-adjoint element. So this norm here is just equal to the spectral radius of A star times A. And from this, we see that this norm that we chose, and which was an arbitrary C star norm, is completely determined by the spectral radius. And the spectral radius has initially nothing to do with norms. It's just defined in terms of absolute value. It's determined by the algebraic structure of A. So really, this spectral norm has nothing to do with norms in themselves, or it's not dependent on norms. It's dependent on the algebraic structure of A, which means that the C star norm must be unique. And the statement just follows trivially. So let's just go over quickly what we have learned in this short lecture, or learned and learned, what we went over. First off, we have that spectral theory is an important tool to understand general Banach algebras. And in particular, for C star algebras, it's going to be essential if we want to understand them more intimately. And First off, if we have an element A, then its spectrum is always going to be a non-empty compact set in the set of complex numbers. And this implies many things. For instance, that the only simple unit element commuted in Banach algebra is actually the set of complex numbers, up to isomorphism, of course. And this in, is sort of the basic theory that we went over. But we also have the spectral radius, which is defined as the supremum of, over all the elements of the spectrum. And this can be calculated using the norm on the algebra by this formula here, which we call the spectral radius formula. And this spectral radius formula has some implications. And for our purposes, one of the more interesting ones is that the spectral radius formula implies that there is at most one norm that makes a given star algebra into a C star algebra. Note, for instance, that this doesn't guarantee that there is a C-star norm for a given star algebra. But if there is a C-star norm on a given star algebra, then that norm is going to be the only C-star norm that we have. Now, once we have all of this, we can probably just go on with going over the theory or the Gelfand theory of general Banach star algebra. So that's actually quite exciting because once we get into sort of the Gelfand theory for commutative Banach star algebras, then we really get into some interesting aspects of the C star algebra theory that we're going to use again and again to prove more and more subtle results until we get to the non commutative Gelfand Neimark theorem, which is sort of the culmination of the course. But for now, See you later and have a good one.